Freedom of speech. Fundamental rights. Freedom of uh, conscience. Academic freedom. Freedom of press. And the right to listen. You're listening to So to Speak, the free speech podcast brought to you by FIRE, the foundation for individual rights in education. Welcome back to So to Speak, the free speech podcast, where every other week we take an uncensored look at the world of free expression through personal stories and candid conversations. I am, as always, your host, Nico Perino, and I'm here today at Villanova University with my colleague from FIRE, Ryan, Ryan Weiss. Hi. This is your first time on the show? This is, yes. And we're bringing you here because we're talking about video games. This is, we've been doing this podcast for three and a half years now, and we've never talked about video games, and you are the resident FIRE expert on them. Yeah, there are a few staff members at FIRE who play video games, but I would say I might be the most obsessed of them. So, yeah, that's well, why I'm here. Well, I grew up playing uh, a lot of RPG games, role-playing games, and I think still my favorite video game of all time was Final Fantasy X. At least it's the one that stuck with me a lot. Now I just come home to decompress uh, and play Call of Duty or Madden. Um, right now I'm playing Mario Kart Deluxe 8. Yep. Uh, no violence there. <laughs> but. No. Um, yeah, I think um, Comic Mischief is the um, the rating on that, or that's the reason that it has an E for Everyone rating is Comic Mischief. Ah, uh, yeah, bananas, throwing in bananas in front of your opponent. Yes. But uh, the guest of honor today, uh, of course, is Professor Patrick M. Markey. He is the co-author of of a book with Christopher J. Ferguson called Moral Combat, Why the War on Violent Video Games is Wrong. Professor, thanks for coming on the show. Ah, thanks for having me. So this is a topic, violent video games, that has been in the news almost since the origin of video games, uh, or the first violent video game, that is. But it's one that has been more in the news as of late as a result of school shootings. There is a concern on behalf of some people that violent video games and the almost ubiquity of video games in young adult life uh, has led to more aggression, more susceptibility to violence. Uh, President Trump, after the shootings in Parkland, told Florida Attorney General Pam Bondi that I'm hearing more and more people seeing the level of violence in video games is really shaping young people's thoughts. And then, of course, after the El Paso shooting, he said, we must stop the glorification of violence in our society. This includes the gruesome and grisly video games that are now commonplace. It is too easy today for troubled youth to surround themselves with a culture that celebrates violence. And then, of course, former Vice President Joe Biden recently mentioned violent video games, he said, of a meeting he had in Silicon Valley with a developer, video game developer, that uh, these games teach you how to kill people, essentially. So a topic of much discussion, especially surrounding the school shootings. But let's take a step back before we actually get into that. I want to learn your interest in the topic more generally. Were you a gamer? Uh, yeah, I, I was and I am, and I game with my children. I gamed with my parents when I was a child. It was a very social activity to do growing up, and it's still, with children today, it's still extremely social activity that they do. The research that we did in video games started, oh my goodness, over a decade ago, in which case we would do research basically showing a link um, or a potential link between video games and aggressive feelings after playing video games. And where our lab really got going, especially me personally, got moved to really up our video game research and look at more horrific acts of violence was following um, the Sandy Hook shooting. That after the Sandy Hook shooting, uh, news media started citing our research as potential evidence that video games could be contributing to this crime or this horrific act. And at the time, it kind of took me aback because, and I understand why they did that, but to me, our research that we were doing in our lab really was not generalizable to that type of level of violence. And I realized that we don't really know how far we can take research that we had done in laboratories and apply it to school shootings or just general homicides, aggravated assaults, things of that sort. And so that moment kind of really galvanized us as a group, especially other scholars in the field too, to understand, can we really generalize these findings to these kind of horrific acts of violence? So those initial findings, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, found that there was some sort of elevated aggression after playing video games. Could that be said about anything that gets the blood pressure going? Movies, playing sports, video games get your blood pressure Certainly, going. yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I, it's important to point out that this was, our research also at the time was kind of a product of the time that 
as scholars, we kind of, and I put myself in this group, went out too much into video games examining their potential negative effects and not being critical enough of our own research, that we overstepped our data very often. And again, I definitely put myself in this category as a researcher who about 10 years ago were committing these types of sins of overstepping my data, that when you look at the typical laboratory study done at the time and still done now sometimes, what most of them did was examine things like so the, the average laboratory study, they'd have randomly, they'd have half the people, subjects play video games, violent video games for 15 minutes, half play nonviolent video games for 15 minutes. And then afterward, they'd measure some kind of outcome. Uh, one way that it would be done is they just give them a questionnaire and say, like, how hostile do you feel? How angry do you feel? And they'd find, sure, after people played violent video games, they reported feeling more hostile. The rub is, obviously, if you just saw a sad movie and I asked you after you saw the sad movie, do you feel sad? You'd probably say, yeah, I feel sad. But it doesn't mean it causes clinical depression. But the problem was we were taking that research done on video games and saying, aha, this probably shows that it makes children angry in the long run. And even when we tried to look at other measures of aggression besides just self-report, uh, we'd use these proxy measures of aggression because it's hard to measure actual aggression in a laboratory. And so they would do things like, um, one thing they do is they'd uh, uh, create a task where after playing a video game or nonviolent video game, they'd have people, subjects, give the opportunity to blast other people with white, irritating noise, kind of like, Shh. and you could blast them by altering the volume of the white noise or the duration of the white noise. And what they found is generally people who play violent video games blasted people with this white noise. But the problem here was it turns out that how we measured that uh, outcome was all over the map. Some researchers measured it just by how, how they turned up the volume. Others multiplied duration times intensity. Uh, some took the logarithm of them. Like It was all these different ones. In fact, there's, there's uh, one clever researcher in Germany counted up. There's about 130 different ways we use these two measures or these two ways of, uh, of uh, adjusting the volume and intensity to measure aggression. And the problem is what he found was you could show anything you wanted with a study, that there's too much variability in those potential results. Um, my favorite study that's done in this area is the hot sauce paradigm. And in the hot sauce paradigm, what we do is people play violent video games and non-violent video games. Then afterward, they go do another study, but really it's part of the same study. And in that study, they're mad at, we make them mad at another person, the person, they hear the person say something mean about them or whatever. And then they make them a taco. It sounds very bizarre, I know. And you measure, and you find out this other person doesn't like hot sauce. And they measure how much hot sauce do they put on this person's taco. And what they find out is a person who played violent video games put some more hot sauce on their taco than those who don't play violent video games. And sure, okay, that's fine. But the problem is, again, we are taking this research and generalizing something like this hot sauce to school shootings. And what a lot of us were concerned about is this is too much, that we're overstepping our bounds, that maybe I don't want a person to play violent video games to make me a taco, but that definitely does not mean that he or she is going to go on and be a school shooter. And so to overcome that, We've kind of since moved on to look at more ecological data of things like, you know, profiling school shooters or actually examining homicide rates and so forth. Yeah, that's what that was one thing that I was wondering is how do you actually determine the connection, the profiles of school shooters? But they're rare. I mean, school shootings, although they're in the news quite often um, because they're so tragic, uh, they, you say it's more likely your child to get struck by lightning or get in a car accident or die of a bee sting, for example, than die in a school shooting. So how do you how do you get a large enough sample size in order to actually analyze the things that might lead a potential school shooter to become an actual school? Yeah, shooter? Yeah, I mean, you're you're you're. Thank gosh, we don't have enough data on some of <laughs> yeah, this, right? right? Like we're not looking for more data in this world. Unfortunately, there are a lot more school shootings then get reported, especially school shootings committed by black youths and seeing that that sort. It tends to be the Columbines, usually typically a white youth with white victims that gets reported most often. So there's a lot of school shootings that don't get reported uh, and that have nothing to do with things like gang violence or drugs or anything, just typical school shootings. Um, so there is data out there. And our lab and the Secret Service of all people actually have worked on profiling school shooters. And when we look at video game habits of school shooters, what's interesting is regardless of the data you look at, the Secret Service or ours, it's basically the same story that we find about 13 to 20 percent of school shooters had a, 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 a decent interest in violent video games. And the issue is, if you look at the average high school student, male, 
those mm-hmm. tend to be the most school shooters, you find that about 70% of them have interest in violent video games. And so what's actually interesting here is there is a link between violent video games and school shootings, but it goes in the opposite direction of what we tend to think, that if anything, school shooters play less violent video games than the average male high school student. Yeah, and you actually talk in your book about well, let's take it. Let's talk about a couple of the school shooters. So there was one, I believe, it's Sandy Hook, mm-hmm. right? Uh, this school shooter played video games, but the most common one that they played was like Dance Dance Revolution. Yeah, and as someone who played a lot of Dance Dance Revolution when I was in high school, that was fascinating to me that the Sandy Hook shooter's favorite game was going to the arcade and playing Dance Dance Revolution. Yeah, and well, what's interesting about that case is that that one was obviously linked to Call of Duty is the one that I got linked to. Yeah, because they and, also and, played Call of Duty. Yeah, and he yeah. owned Call of Duty, but again... Mm-hmm. I mean, I think both of you guys said you've yeah, you played Call, Call of Duty. Duty. Yeah. So, so it's a, a million game sell. That's not okay. surprising that a youth owned Call of Duty. Um, but what they found out is in the investigation afterward, they kept tracing his GPS going back and forth to this movie theater and they couldn't figure out why. And they went to the movie theater and talked to them. And exactly as you guys said, what they found out is he was going to this movie and obsessively playing Dance Dance Revolution. So if he had an obsession with anything, it wasn't Call of Duty, it was Dance Dance Revolution. And even in interviews with people who knew him, when they asked them about his video game habits, they all report that his favorite video game was Super Mario Brothers. Mm. Um, So again, it's not the traditional games, but there's still that narrative out there that's wrong, that the Sandy Hook suitor kind of was this loner who stayed in his basement, obsessing over Call of Duty, practicing on Call of Duty, And really, there's absolutely no evidence to suggest that happened other than the fact he happened to own a copy of Call of Duty. Yeah. And then the Virginia Tech shooting, that person had never played a video game, correct? Which is amazing. I mean, Uh that uh, student at Virginia Tech uh, who who never played or didn't own video games and didn't seem to play them anymore, uh, they know this from interviews with roommates. And his roommates even had commented that they thought it was weird that he didn't play video games. In a way, it is kind of weird, again, that a college student didn't play any video games at all. Mm -hmm. Um, But again, that one is linked to the video game Counter-Strike. And it's only linked to that, not because he owned it, because there's no evidence he ever played it even. It's simply because of how he had dressed during the shootings, that he dressed in a manner that kind of looked like a character from Counter-Strike. But other than that, there's absolutely no link at all between video games and that shooting. But again, that story's still out there. And even in Columbine that you suggested before, that um, that students, that's the one that really started research into violent video games when we really started looking at the, if they cause violence and so forth. And that one, it's linked to Doom is the game. And again, they certainly played Doom. But there are all these stories about how they practiced on Doom. They created levels in their on Doom uh, to mimic their high school. And actually what the researchers or what the investigators found is they couldn't find any of that. They had created one level, which was this moon level, it had nothing to do with their high school. But there's no evidence at all that they practiced kind of their high school shooting in, in the world of doom. Yeah. But again, that's out there and people repeat that over and over again. Now, there is an instinct after one of these tragedies, of course, to try and understand why it happened. Uh, but there's also an instinct to do something about it. And that's where we see some of the gun control uh, reform efforts come into play. But seeing or suspecting this sort of link has led some places and some politicians, as we've uh, discussed, to suggest banning violent video games. And there was an effort to try and prohibit the purchase of violent video games by minors in California, right? Mm -hmm. What happened there? I mean, so that ended up becoming the Supreme Court. Case. Yeah, this was the 2011 yeah. Brown Supreme Court case. Yeah, and I I purposely try to stay out of legislation. So as a scientist, I I tried to inform legislators, but I try not to. So I didn't sign any briefs in that or anything along those lines. I, I purposely try to keep myself out of the, the 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 discussion of it. I mean, so obviously, what ended up happening in that case is it got we got rejected, it got shot down. Uh, that video games are not banned to minors in California. They actually wanted to put a little label on it. It was like a cigarette smoking yeah. label almost. That warning, these will, these can kill you uh, type of label. Um, but yeah, it ended up getting shot down. And the justices had some negative things to say about the research in the area. That basically they argued that it wasn't conclusive enough, that you know it's kind of these odd methods that were used and so forth. Um, I Again, though, I personally wouldn't use judges to judge scientific data. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't, even though they kind of agree with how I go in, in this debate, um, uh, 
it's I wouldn't necessarily use that as evidence um, that video games aren't really bad or good. That yeah, it was, it was their opinion or their judgment, obviously. But um, but it's you know again, it's a person not trained in, in this discipline kind of making comment on it. Well, that's kind of the reason that we wanted to talk to you. Of course, is um, you know we have an interest in in free expression to the extent that uh, these games are works of art, and mm-hmm. I, I think most people would argue that they are. Uh, they would be protected under the First Amendment's uh, protection for freedom of expression. And we've heard, and I'd, I'd like to hear about your experience talking to people who work in the industry, we've heard that there there's concerns in the industry that that th- there are certain things that they build into their games or that there are certain uh, types of games like Grand Theft Auto that legislators have their eyes on and uh, that it might come to the point where you have to depend on the First Amendment in order to actually create these games. I mean, what are you hearing behind the scenes? Well, I hear nothing. I, I completely- <laughs> Try and stay out of it. Yeah, I compl- just like I don't uh, try to make uh, too many comments on law, I definitely don't talk to video game developers mm-hmm. or anything along those lines. And that's completely on purpose, that I'm a, a researcher in this industry. And one thing um, we often get blamed for is being in the pocket of big video game manufacturers. I, I've never realized there's a big pocket out there that I could fall into. Um, but me and my co-author and every researcher I know in this area- Nobody takes money from game companies. It's actually something we actively avoid doing. Um, so I can't tell you what's happening behind the scenes in terms of, I wish I could. Um, but again, it, it's something we try to avoid doing. Uh, the First Amendment, I mean, that's obviously what it came down to in the Supreme Court case. Yeah. That they judged it that, that it is kind of be viewed as art, essentially. Um, and as, as a gamer, I certainly think that's a legitimate argument to, to, to see it as is – and I think this is where you see a disconnect between older folks, and, and I'm older, and younger folks, that us older folks, very often, we don't see the art in video games. We just see it as basically Space Invaders and Pac-Man, right? Mm-hmm. It, and we can argue if that's art or not. But certainly, as time has moved on, you know, nowadays, we have games with deep stories, just as deep sometimes as as, as film, like, you know, like The Last of Us. And like, you have games that can actually make evoke, you cry. Yeah, make you cry, evoke emotions, make you angry, as yeah. we know from research. So, I mean, you can certainly alter people's moods from video games just the way film and books and so forth do. And I think that's really what's going to be happening as time goes on is it's going to be basically us older folks are going to kind of be dying out. And the younger folks who grew up with video games, they're the ones that are going to start to recognize more of it as an art form, that this is just as legitimate as cinema, just as legitimate as books and so forth, and a way to to express ourselves and so forth. And so that's where I think our panic will eventually go away from video games is as us old folks start to die off who didn't grow up. Well, I grew up, but a lot of us didn't grow up around video games and the younger generation who did um, doesn't fear it anymore. Now, they'll have some other panic that they're oh, going to be worried about. Of course, as new, as, as new technologies come along, there's always panics that are commensurate with them. But Ryan, I want to let you jump in. Yeah. Um, one of the interesting things I thought about the book is that you tie – Um, outrage over violent video games, not to those games being the most violent ones around, but that they represented leap forwards in technology. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, Doom as the first really famous first-person shooter with graphics that people saw as more realistic, Mortal Kombat with its um, graphics that were digitized actors then edited to performing these gruesome fatalities. Um, virtual reality is obviously an emerging technology that's becoming cheaper and cheaper and is now accessible to average people in the way that it wasn't even three years ago. Um, Do you see any possibility there that virtual reality might represent the next leap forward that might cause the next kerfuffle over violent video games? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, it's hard to predict the next moral panic. Uh, in technology. <laughs> I mean, my guess is it's smartphones. I think we're kind of seeing that already, that there's a, a, a in social media, smartphones and so forth. I think virtual reality certainly could be it if it does he, hit that point that it's popular enough. I mean, you're right. Certainly like PlayStation now has its own headset and Oculus and all, all these other brands that are now more available. It's still not quite as mainstream as, you know, Nintendo and Microsoft and so forth. Mm-hmm. Um, but if that does happen, I would guess you would see that. And exactly the reason why you said is that Every time there's a leap in technology, parents get worried. And so, like you said, we saw it with Moral Combat. We saw it with um, Doom. And we also saw it with, I don't know if you remember, the Night Trap Night game Trap, yeah. um, for the Sega Genesis, which is this terrible B-level movie where you're actually protecting the people in the game from these really weird-looking vampires. This was released in 92. 
Um, and it actually started the uh, Senate hearing on it um, uh, uh, around whether or not video games should have a rating system. Uh, the video game industry eventually decided to self-regulate itself like the movie industry, yeah. to, so they avoided any anything. But that's what uh, began it, really. Um, interesting side note from that is after the ESRB, that's the, the video game rating industry, uh, was created, um, we actually saw an explosion in violent video games. That what happened is after it was created, uh, video game companies like Nintendo felt more free to make violent video games. Um, well, not that Nintendo, but they, uh, on their systems, they released it. A good example is Mortal Kombat 2 was released on the Super Nintendo with blood in it after the ESRB because they could put an M rated on it and say, oh, well, we rated this game. It's okay now. Um, and so in some ways, it had a, a backfire of people who were concerned about violence because it actually just created the ability to make even more violent video games. And you also, I mean, <laughs> I remember when I was young and I would see that M on, on front of a video game or whatever, and, and that would draw me to it. It was like it sure. became forbidden fruit. Right. Well, again, and I'm older, but I remember back when they first started putting the parental advisory lyrics on, well, albums, CDs, now on iTunes, I suppose, where you'd see like, oh, it has explicit lyrics in it. And as a kid, you're like, oh, that's a yeah. bad one. And that's another great example of a moral uh, panic that happened at one point was just in that time with Tipper Gore and so forth, when they created this group that was worried about uh, rock and roll music at the time and if it was damaging children and you know they created this list of the, the most vile songs and on that list was uh, Cindy Lauper and her song Shebop. Uh, they were scared it was going to teach masturbation to teens because I mean who would ever guess that <laughs> that could happen um, but at the time and again it's important to know like we laugh at all these past moral, moral panics like comic books we all think ah, how mm -hmm. silly was that you know Elvis Presley they were worried about Dungeons and Dragons da -da, like so silly and but the point is, at the time, they didn't think it was silly. Mm -hmm. This was serious stuff, just like video games are right now for a lot of people that I predict in a decade or two decades, we'll look back and say, oh, those silly people were scared about video games. But every moral panic, the people who are pushing it, who are really worried about it, they're being genuine. Like they really are worried about it. I mean, there might be some people taking advantage of it, but there's a lot of parents and so forth that just really want to do what they think is best for their kids. And so it does become a hard cycle to break because as a parent, you usually do want to do what's best for your child. Um, and so it can get kind of difficult. Mm -hmm. But at least now I think we have the data that shows that video games aren't harmful in the way that um, people were afraid in the mid-90s. Yeah. Well, and I think what's the biggest uh, thing that's happened in video game research that shows that are the ecological studies. So not even the school shooter studies because – Thank, again, thank goodness they're rare, but the bigger worry, if you're ever worried about being murdered or being assaulted, it's probably not at a school. It's going to be out on the street and so forth. And when researchers have looked at data like that, we actually find that when violent video games are released on release dates or when people are home playing violent video games. Yeah, this was my we, next question. Yeah, we see violent crime drop. Um, and it's consistent over and over again. And this has been done in labs, in our lab. It's been done by economists. It's been done by criminologists that whenever violent media comes out, and this is true also for movies and televisions, it, back when you used to have, have to watch television at certain times, um, they had the exact same findings that when people are consuming violent media, we see dips in homicides and aggravated assaults. So again, we see that video games are linked to these horrific acts of violence, but they're linked in the exact opposite direction from what common sense would tell us, that the data actually consistently shows that when people are, are, are playing games, it's actually safer out there than more dangerous. Because they're, in, they're in, uh, in home, at home in front of their consoles. That's our guess. So the data are what the data are. Mm -hmm. The the why is the bigger question. Big question yeah. yeah. And so, I mean, the probably the the one that gets uh, talked about the most is the idea of catharsis, the idea that if you – this is an old Freudian idea, actually, that it's the idea that you just have to let out your anger in some kind of constructive manner. It's almost like we're teapots and the steam is boiling up in us and there's a cork over the top and we just have to let out the steam a little bit. Otherwise, we'll explode. The idea of a stress ball at yeah, work. Yeah, or, or punching a pillow or yeah. whatever. And it sounds cool. Uh, the problem is research doesn't back it up. Researchers who typically do research on you know having subjects come in and punch pillows and stuff, they find it doesn't do anything. Um, and so, yeah, we think the – explanation for why violent video games are uh, linked to decreases in crime is exactly what you said, Nico, that we think that it's that 
when people are playing violent video games, they're simply off the streets. So they're less likely to be perpetrators of, of violence and they're less likely to be victims of violence. And so it's essentially removed themselves. And the neat thing about it is the people most likely to be perpetrators and victims are adolescent males. And those are the people most attracted to violent video games. And so in a weird way, it, self -tar it targets this group that's most at risk and removes them from interacting with each other, thereby potentially making the world a little bit safer, making it safer on Yeah, you talk, you talk in your book about how the times where it's least likely that you'll see violent crime committed are what, between like 7 a.m. and 3 p.m. when students oh, are in school. School, yeah, yeah, yeah. We take into account school days, yeah. And that's the, the, the idea of this idea of people, criminals and victims have to be together for a crime to happen seems so simple, but it does actually have a, a name. It's called routine activity theory and criminologists use it to explain all types of, of, of criminal behavior. Um, but like I said, we can just apply it here and it seems to work so perfectly. And like I said, it's not just video games, it's all violent media that economists, one economist did a, a study with movies and they found that around the movie theater, if they were playing a violent movie, crime would dip in that area. Mm. Um, and the neat thing about all of this is we don't see a bump up later on. So it's not like they're home off the streets playing Grand Theft Auto V and they're not committing crime. But once they turn off the console and walk out, like, look out, it's, we, see, we never see a bump back up. Like there's never a, a, a overreaction to the reduction in crime. So it appears just to reduce crime by removing people from the street. And then you don't have that. You don't have to pay the price later on, if you will. Yeah, you say, the, I think, in the book, uh, the biggest correlation between violent crime is uh, like the temperature outside. I mean, that, I mean, that's that's what we used to, as an example of what researchers, what I'm talking about. We use the same methodologies that researchers had used in the past to show that when it's hot outside, people, there tends to be more violent crime. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, an example of how this study goes, it's, it's good to use the heat example, is what researchers have known for a while is that um, heat outside is correlated to violent crime, that when it's hotter, you tend to have increases in violent crime. And, and uh, everyone knows the old adage, correlation doesn't mean causation. So just because they're correlated doesn't mean that happens. So what we do as researchers, we try to break that relationship, that we try to throw in any other variables we think that might be potentially a third variable, throw in things like police presence, uh, socioeconomic issues, things of this sort. You throw into your models and you try to get rid of that correlation. And with heat, for example, there's nothing that people have been able to throw into the model to break it. That no matter what, when it's warmer, there's more crime, and we can't think of a third variable that's causing it. So at some point, we say, oh, maybe there really is something going on here. And with video games, it's the same thing. What our lab and other labs have done is we look at the correlation between video game play or when games are released and violent crime. And then we throw in as many variables as we can think of that might break that relationship. And just like Heat, no one's been able to find any other variables that could explain why when people are playing violent video games, crime tends to go down. Is there anything that we can say about playing video games? It doesn't, doesn't even have to do with violence. Like, does it does it make people better problem solvers or critical thinkers, or is, does it have negative effects because it makes them less? Uh, I don't know, less social. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, what can we say? Well, I mean, video, video games are a medium, so they're neither inherently good or bad, right? So they 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 can be whatever they are, just like. Literature can be whatever it is. It could be good or bad, depending on, on how it's used and written. And video games themselves, how they are now with social, say, for example, what we tend to find is actually video games tend to be a pretty positive social outlet for most. I'm talking about youth now, but adults, too, especially since so many youth are playing video games that uh, youth themselves report that video games they use to make friends and create new friendships and things of that sort. You play online and multiplayer. They play online. They learn. It's just like play in general. I mean, let's be honest. Video game play when you're playing with others is play. It's a virtual play, but it's still play. And you have the same exact advantages as you do with playing in a sandbox with another kid that you do. You learn rules. You learn how to communicate. You learn how to control your emotions. You learn all these important things in life. And that's what play really does for us as, as humans, like just playing in general. Mm -hmm. It's so important, but it gets discounted so often. And so video games tend to have that same advantage as as other media in terms of play. I mean, there's other things that they that they can potentially do too. Um, that there's, again, they, they make the, the world potentially a little bit safer place. There's some arguments people have made that it might create moral development in some individuals um, and so forth. I mean, obviously the the... Elephant in the room with video games and their potential negative effect that's not violence is video game addiction. 
I mean, I think one of you guys said you guys played games so much that, that, or that maybe you had said, Ryan, that, oh. that you play so much you were worried or something along yeah, those lines. Yeah, I want to get into this addiction <laughs> yeah. question too. And that's a, it's a hot topic in video game research. And right now the data are really early. So the World Health Organization created a formal diagnosis of basically basically video game addiction. Yeah, Ryan was telling me that on the yeah, yeah. yeah, when you wrote the book, that hadn't happened yet. And you mentioned that the American Psychiatric Association might have been about to do that. But then the World Health Organization did it in, I think, May 2019. Sounds about right. Yeah, yeah. And, and so- my basic belief on it is it's a little too early to jump the gun on if we should have a formal diagnosis for it. Certainly, there are people that are addicted to video games. There are people addicted to food. There are people addicted to sex. Now, food and sex do not have a formal diagnosis. Like, So not everything that we can be addicted to is recognized in this manner. And so the question is, is video game addiction high enough that it should be at the same level as other uh, types of addictive behaviors like alcoholism and things of that sort? Um and so it's unknown right now if, if it's there. The biggest study that I know of done on this topic was done at Oxford, where they examined two or 3,000 people. I'm going off the top of my head. And they looked at the prevalence of video game addiction in this group. And they found that it was about 1% of them had a, a video game, could be diagnosed as a video game addiction using uh, the American Psychiatric Association's guidelines, which are actually pretty close to the World Health Organization's. Um, so about 1%. So it's not a giant prevalent group. But, you know, even if it's not, it still doesn't mean it's unimportant. And so what they then looked at is of these people who are diagnosed, how are they different than people who are not diagnosed? Are they less sociable? Are they you know, less physically fit? Do they stay inside all the time? And across the board, they really couldn't find any differences except for one. Those people who were classified as addicted to video games tended to play more video games than those who weren't classified. Uh, but otherwise, they had just as many social interactions. They're just as emotionally happy and so forth. So it's fines like that that you have to be very careful with on is this something that we want to potentially make seem like a bigger problem than it is. Again, a parent who has a child who's really addicted to video games, that's a horrific situation. So I don't want to make light of that. But the problem is we might have too many incidents where people are misdiagnosed with this type of issue. Um, for example, you might have a parent whose child is depressed and they go see a therapist and the therapist just heard about all this video game addiction and they have this checklist where they can go down and figure out if this client and sure they show they're depressed, but they also show video game addiction. So what's the therapist going to suggest? You know, get rid of the video game console. Let's try to wean the child from the video game console. But there could be a danger there. If the video game console is their primary social outlet, then what you're doing is you're taking this social outlet that they have to their friends and, and everyone else, and you're completely removing it. And, and now you have a depressed them. kid without any social outlet anymore. And so, again, that might be what we want to do eventually. But I just think to, right now we're too far ahead of the data that we want to be very careful. There's a real danger in creating a panic about something uh, that might not be as prevalent as we think about it. And even parents who are worried about their kids being addicted to games, again, I, I have sympathy for parents whose children are really addicted. Most of them, when they talk to me, they don't really mean their kids is addicted to video games because they'll kind of roll their eyes, kind of like what we did, and they'll say, mm -hmm. oh, little Johnny's so addicted to Fortnite. Mm -hmm. You would never do that if you thought your kid was addicted to heroin. You'd never say, oh, little Johnny's so addicted to heroin. Like, so even <laughs> we're just misusing the word addiction in this concept. We usually mean now when we say addiction in video games, irritating, too much. You know, We as parents don't approve of it. And hey, I get it. Again, I have a teenager and I get it. Sometimes he might play video games too much and I might want to limit it. But it's not I'm not trying to limit it to prevent depression or anything along those lines. But are game developers trying to get people addicted? I mean, to a certain extent, you can say anyone who creates something is trying to get people to enjoy that yeah. something that it hooks it before commercials and television yeah. shows. They try to keep you yeah. around. Um, but I have. One, the last interview I conducted for this podcast was with a guy, Luke Morgan, who wrote an article called Addiction and Expression that was in the Hastings Constitutional Law Quarterly, because there are efforts on behalf of some legislators to try and regulate, loot, for example, loot boxes mm -hmm. in video games. Um, Josh Hawley, for example. We should probably, for the benefit of the listeners, explain what loot boxes are first. Yeah, well, do you do? You, I've never oh. actually used a loot box before, but oh, I I guess I can. Yeah, so um, in some games, you can put in real world currency, like pay U.S. dollars to get a kind of in game currency, um, and with that in game currency, you can pay for these things called loot boxes, which is um, kind of like a a mystery 
um, surprise thing. Like it you comes open into it, the game. yeah, it comes into a game and it gives you a random assortment of items. So you're paying real world money for um, the contents of this box of in-game items, and you can't know what it is before you purchase so it. Could be it. new armor for your character. Yeah, or a new sort of gun for your shooter game, or like armor that your character can't even wear, and so you buy another one hoping to get armor for the character that you do play. Yeah, and there's some science behind this. So in Luke Morgan's article, he talks about John Hobson. And I'll, I'll read a little bit from the article. He said, in April 2015, John Hobson, then the head of user research for Bungie and the holder of a doctorate in behavioral and brain sciences, spoke to the 2015 Game Developers Conference. And it was there he revealed how Bungie so carefully created a game meant to hook players and keep them coming back time after time. Those are um, John Hobson's words. Uh, John then proceeded to lay out the behavioral game design that guided Destiny, and that's the game that they created that everyone said was so addictive, uh, development from the beginning, and they, they used what's called variable ratio contingencies. I mean, you, you, you're the um, scholar of this here, you probably know what that is, but essentially it's random chances at receiving a reward upon the completion of activity, and then Hobson noted that this design choice produces, quote, a high consistent rate of activity. He then goes on to say, the classic example of this that hopefully none of you know too well is the slot machine. So every time you pull the handle of the slot machine, there is a chance of winning. There is a chance of getting a reward on that pull. You don't have to pull 10 times before you get something. The first pull could win you the jackpot. And that's what produces this incredibly high, powerful rate of activity. So this is a good thing, John Hobson says, in that there's a high level activity. There's a high level of interest. It's very motivating. It's very addictive, he says, as anyone who has played slots or gambled in any other way can tell you. So I've I was wondering what you think about that sort of game design that seizes on variable ratio contingencies. Yeah. So it's important to keep this separate from video game addiction, especially mm -hmm. like for the World Health Organization. That is not talking about loot boxes. Loot boxes are really a completely different animal in, in this world. And quite frankly, it's because loot boxes became really popular kind of after a lot of the research had started on video game addiction and so forth. There are some good researchers starting now research on loot boxes. But, again, but it's one of the things that game developers bake into a game to try and yeah, keep playing. Right. Like in that Destiny example, um, they're actually talking about rewards you receive for defeating bosses. So while Destiny does have loot boxes, the thing that he's talking about in that specific quote is a reward you get for doing an in-game activity that you don't need to pay extra money to do. Yeah. Yeah. And so there is a good argument. So again, I, I would separate the two because the question is, I like to think of it this way, that one is our video games addictive? Like, can we just take a video game with no loot boxes? And is that addictive? And that's traditionally up until loot boxes kind of became a thing a few years ago. That's what everyone meant when they talked about video game addiction. Now loot boxes are kind of the, the new thing that people are starting to look into. And the two are kind of getting mixed together. And they, they really belong separate because you might have an issue where loot boxes might be really addictive, but video games themselves are fine or the opposite. You know, you could have any combination. And right now the research for video game part is is kind of inconclusive. Loot boxes are using the same mechanism as slot machines. Like there's no doubt about it. So there's no reason to suspect that they would be less, I'm gonna put this in quotes, addictive than a slot machine could be addictive. So some people might be more inclined to use loot boxes than others. In fact, there is some early research to suggest that people who are problem gamblers do tend to use loot boxes more. It doesn't mean loot boxes cause problem gambling. It means people who have those characteristics already. So there might be something with loot boxes that's there that might be something that might not be the greatest thing in the world for a gamer in the long run. We don't know yet. It's still too early. The, one of the nice things about loot boxes, though, is you're starting to see it almost start to regulate itself. There's been a lot of backlash from consumers. Yeah, I've heard And that. so you're starting to see game companies try to kind of balance it out a little bit more. They're still there. They still exist, but they're not quite as as uh, in your face as it used to be. I, I mean, think one of the big steps there was that um, when they started getting pressure, I think, from other countries mm -hmm. to regulate loot boxes, um, Sony and Microsoft, Nintendo all agreed basically at the same time that they would require games in the future to disclose the odds of different um, things you would receive mm -hmm. from the loot box so you could at least have some information when purchasing it, how likely you would be to get the thing that you are trying to get. <laughs> Whether that'll actually affect behavior, I think the lotto gives us all yeah. we need to know. About. Yeah, no, I, I, <laughs> exactly. I, I, don't think, I don't think a game company has anything to worry about from that information for exactly what you said. I, I think that, and that's actually the, if you will, the beauty of this variable ratio kind of reward system is that 
we over we think oh the next one no it's going to be the next one no it's mm-hmm. going to be the next one um and so it is it is a thing that that and you don't need a phd in behavioral sciences to know this you don't need a phd in anything to know this that you just need to know that how slot machines work and you got the basic idea of why this works i i do want to um complicate kind of the division between loot boxes and video games because um games can reward loot boxes for both time and money that you put into it Um, Like in Destiny, for example, they have both. They have paid loot boxes and they have loot boxes that you just receive at regular intervals for playing the game. Is it really that different psychologically that you're paying money for one versus paying your time for the other? No, no, no. But randomness is in all games. So, I mean, Mm -hmm. you have randomness in Monopoly when you roll your dice, right? Mm -hmm. So the idea of there being randomness in a game is not by itself an evil thing. At least I wouldn't think it is Um, because randomness is a part of game. I mean... You just use an example like Diablo, like the first Diablo way back when, you know, you get random loot when you when you kill a certain person. You're not paying any money into that, and that's part of the game. And sure, that might make the game more – you want, might, might want to play the game more. We're not talking about video game addiction, though. It just might make mm-hmm. it more interesting. Just like playing Mon- Monopoly, rolling the dice isn't going to necessarily make you want to keep playing. Um, but that's different than – at least I think it's potentially different than paying money for that. That I think you have one situation where you might be taking advantage of – Advantage may be too strong, but might be taking advantage, let's just go with that, of people who want to play the game and they just want to get that armor. And so they keep paying $5 every time to get this loot box or another person wants that armor. They're just going to play the game for five more hours. So I think it is different when money is involved. And again, that's a personal thing. The psychology behind it might be the same. But my worry about when money is involved is you have the potential negative outcome of spending money Mm -hmm. on this type of thing. Um, so yeah, yeah, there's enough of a concern around it that they're starting to be see, see legal scholarship questioning whether that would implicate the first amendment prohibiting video game distributors from baking loot box variable ratio contingencies <laughs> into yeah. their, into their games. Um, but I think the, the holding from the Brown case in 2011 would still hold in so far as, um, code is held to be speech and protected by the first amendment there to the extent that there's artistic intent in these games, then that implicates the First Amendment. But we do have a history in the United States of regulating uh, addiction. Yeah. Um, or gambling. Yeah. I mean, because I mean, that's at the end, I think that's what the the legal question is, not the research question is, is, is this gambling with loot boxes that you're putting money in, but you're not really getting a prize? Or is it more like Dave and Buster's? You know, I, I don't yeah. know. Like what, what, what exactly? Again, I'm not, I'm not a, obviously a, a legal individual, but um but yeah, I think I think that tends to be the bigger thing is, is just simply a form of gambling. Yeah, I wanted uh, you mentioned social media right now. Do you ha- do any research into mm-hmm. that? Because I, I only well, ask um, insofar as uh, our boss Greg Lukianoff wrote a New York Times bestseller in which they speculated on uh, with Jonathan Haidt, of course, on uh, some sort of connection or correlation between social media and uh, you know, anxiety and depression. What has your research found? Yeah, so. Uh, with and, Jonathan, and don't hold back. Yeah, <laughs> no, that's fine. Um, <laughs> it so, is a free speech podcast. <laughs> so I, I think that social media and the research that you're talking about specifically um, and other scholars in the area that have done research on the link between social media and depression and suicide and so forth, I think it is potentially contributing to the, the ongoing moral panic right now that we are way ahead of our data, that – our data right now linking uh, um, social media to these kind of outcomes is so limited. As an example, um, other scholars have found, supposedly found links between social media and things like depression or, or unhappiness and so forth. But when you actually look at the research, you find, first of all, they don't even measure social media use. They measure screen use. And they measure screen use at a time period where there even wasn't social media sometimes. that So the, the one of the variables is a little questionable. So it's it's being able to separate out the social media from the screen right. use. Right. But then the other issue Because not is, all screen use is social media But use. even when researchers have examined specific social media use or even screen use, um, they use self-reports. So they'll say- how many hours did you use your phone last week? Or how many hours did you do this last week? Whatever. But then other researchers, more recently, David Ellis did this. He actually found that when you actually look at how many hours a person actually uses social media or screens and relates it to what they think they did, 
they're completely different worlds that we have no idea how much social media we use in terms of time that some of us overestimated dramatically. Some of us underestimated. Well, iPhone like, gives you reports yeah, on yeah, like, yeah. what so, you're so, doing. So you could do a study using that. But the point is all of this panic was built on self-reports. And now we know they're completely invalid, that there's no at all link to it at all. And the final issue is we think of this as social media causes depression or social media causes the same but that's not how anything works. It's, it, we, it's not like a light switch where it's on or off. It's like a dimmer switch. And we want to know how much does it cause. That's a very yeah. kind of nuanced. And you might think from all the worry and everything about social media and depression that, you know, maybe it, you, we explain 40 percent of the variability in depression from social media. Or maybe if you're cynical, maybe just 10 percent. But actually what we find out is when you look at even these are studies done by the person you talked about and other people in the area that their studies find that the amount that the variability that we can explain in depression that's explained from social media use from these self-report measures is about 0.3%. So less than 1% of the so even if we take that as a finding, it's a minuscule finding compared to the amount of worry that's around it. Yeah, to kind of connect it back to what we were talking about before with addiction, I mean, some social media creators are using this kind of variable ratio contingencies to write the code for how your news feed appears or mm -hmm. when you get that little yellow or little red button at the bottom of your Facebook app, you know, are you going to get the red button? Are you not? You open yeah. up the app and check out. But as you said before, I mean, again, if we if I were to find out that that social media use and we, we had a good measurement, and it was highly related to these terrible outcomes, then, oh, my gosh, I'd be very worried about it. Mm -hmm. But the fact that they're using these doesn't necessarily mean that they're as effective as they think they are. It doesn't mean they don't work, but it doesn't mean that they're as effective as they think they are. And it also certainly doesn't mean it's causing depression or suicide or anything along those lines. As you said before, all basically media creators across time have tried to keep their audience engaged. And so- Television, radio, we're yeah. We're always yeah. doing something. Otherwise, I, it'd be bad media. At the end of a chapter, I like to try to leave on a little bit of a cliffhanger so that mm -hmm. maybe you'll start the next chapter, yeah. right? So- Am I using psychology? Sure. I mean, is it deep psychology? Not at all, yeah. but I'm still using. So I'm not trying to rewire anyone's brain when I do that or anything like that. And just like a lot of these are, it's, it sounds sinister, mm -hmm. but really at the end of the day, there's no data there that's really showing that it's having this immense negative effect on things like depression and suicide and things of that sort. But we sort. are seeing rises in depression and anxiety, or at least, I mean, um, self-reports. Maybe it's just better um, knowledge. Also, when you look at self-harm and suicide, like objective measures rather yeah. than self -reports. Whether that's correlated with social well, media, of course. But even that, it's not quite. So you're doing half of the story in terms of talking about it. Certainly, there's been an increase in suicide. And every suicide is tragic, so I'm not trying to downplay suicide. But if we look back at what suicide rates are about now to what they were in the 90s, they're pretty close. They're not that different from each other. That what had happened is we had a dip in suicides that happened, and now it's kind of come back up to where it was at before. So in the 90s, no social media, suicide rates are about the same as what they are now. So we have to be a little careful with just this rough correlational data. These are not data, by the way, that they're controlling for trends or third variables or anything at all. Like, so when I talked about video games linking to, to homicides, we try to control for these. These are just people, these researchers are just pointing out, hey, suicides have gone up since here. Maybe there's a connection. But when you look at the whole data across time, I mean, suicide data goes back pretty far, you don't see that it's this sudden peak that's out of nowhere. That yeah. I'm not as familiar with the data, and I don't. I think what Greg and John talk about in their book is amongst young people, suicides amongst mm -hmm. young. You see it in particular uh, amongst uh, younger women, who they argue in their book, I guess, are more susceptible to the kind of things that social media might do to you, like the mean girls aspect of social media. Well, I'll but, talk about this since it's a free speech yeah, podcast. Yeah, go for it. In that all of those were created post hoc. They were created after the data was collected. Mm -hmm. So what happened was researchers saw that, oh, it only, you only see this with one group. Oh, it must be because it's it's women. That mm -hmm. There's a danger in doing that, of looking at data and creating a story around it. The other issue with that is if you look at charts and these the data you're talking about, they're only reporting data in that timeline that's really in the later part. They're not going back further to show that it was higher before and then it went down. You're only seeing that one figure really in the last 10 years or so that you need to see the entire data set. And so there is a danger, I think, again, in creating this potential panic that, and this is where I do see a moral panic creating is with cell phones. And again, I might be wrong. Like, I'm not saying that se that social media is, is harmless by any means. I'm saying we don't have the data yet to be this worried about it, that we need to wait for the data. Because just like with video games, 
there's a danger in creating a potential red herring that, especially with, with social media and, say, smartphones, because usually it's smartphones that people are more worried about. If smartphones really aren't causing this, but we make parents really worried, hey, smartphones are making your kids depressed, smartphones are making girls depressed and so forth. If you have a young girl and she seems depressed and you're a parent, you're going to take that smartphone away from her right away because that would be the smart thing to do. Same thing you were talking about with video games. Right, but you've isolated. completely isolated her now because mm-hmm. that is, especially now for this generation, whether we like it or not as parents, that is the primary way that they communicate with their friends, how they set up times to meet It's like taking away their bike. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. that's exactly what it would be like. And so it's not as if – some people say, well, what's the harm? You know, Take it away. You know, It's probably better to just take it away. And – I have no love of, of iPhones. Again, I have a teenage kid. Trust me, it drives me crazy. TikTok, I still don't get it, but <laughs> it drives me insane. And so I get the idea of it. But the problem is if we do something we don't have the data for, we might be causing more harm. Now, we don't know yet, though. And so I think it's really important that as researchers and as clinicians and so forth, we need to be particularly careful about giving advice at this early stage. Is there um one benefit of moral panics insofar as they spur researchers like yourself to do more research. <laughs> they keep us employed, I suppose. Yeah. I mean, it's funny with with our book, Moral Combat, we when we first wrote it a few years ago, we thought, oh, video game, you know, panics are all over now. Nobody's worried about video games. Like this is going to be so old, no one's going to want it. And then unfortunately, I get a text from our great PR staff here and they'll say, uh-oh, there's been a school shooting. You know, you're probably going to get a lot of reporters because- that's what happens, unfortunately, is yeah. that we wor- we don't worry about it for video games. And then there's a tragedy, and then suddenly we get worried about it again. Um, so I would love this not to be part of my career, that it's sad that I do research on video games. And I don't do research on guns, on mental health, on anything that other people are worried about that are related to potentially related to mass shootings. I do it on video games. And that's when everyone wants to talk to me, that... That should not be one of the top issues that that people are worried about after a tragedy, that we shouldn't be worried about video games, that it's taking way too much time. And again, I'm a researcher in this field who makes money uh, by, you know, if, through Villanova, I don't make money otherwise, yeah. whose job is basically to examine violent video games. And I'm telling you, don't worry about it, that they're going to be fine. Leave me alone, that, that I'd rather be ignored in this world because – it's not that important in terms of predicting mass shootings and things of that sort. Yeah. Well, I think that's a good place to end. Although I want to ask you, Ryan, did you have any last questions that you feel compelled to ask oh. the good professor about before we? Um, this the- is kind of out of left field, but one of the first things you say in the book is you mention Marshfield, Massachusetts <laughs> had a ban on public playing of video games. And um, as someone who's followed video game news since I started using the internet probably in 2000. Um, I was shocked that I had never heard that this law was apparently on the books until 2014 and survived two different attempts to have it repealed. Um, in, to your knowledge, was anyone ever prosecuted under this <laughs> law? Um, was there any attempt at civil disobedience? I don't think so. I, as I recall, the law was more for arcade like machines, mm-hmm. not yeah. not home consoles and so forth. Um, no, and it was as I remember, the town's kind of this like touristy kind of town or sleepy town where they're trying to get people to come and, and do things and so forth. That I don't think they had any interest in. You know, they were worried, and and it went into effect in the. 80s. And so this, it didn't originally go into effect because people were worried about violent video games. They were worried about arcades. In the 80s, arcades were kind of these neon dungeons of like, uh, of evil where older kids would smoke. And it was kind of this, so they kind of more wanted to keep the riffraff of of associated with arcades out. Um, But it stayed on the books for a long time. It's a very bizarre case that, that happened. Yeah, no, if I had known about it when it was still around, I think I might have been tempted to do some civil disobedience, <laughs> take a vacation there and see if I could get arrested for playing a video You'd game. You'd have to roll in your arcade, your big arcade yeah. <laughs> pinball box or whatever. But anyway, this has been uh, illuminating and a lot of fun. And Ryan, I want to thank you for joining me as a co-host here. And, and Professor, thanks for coming on. The book is Moral Combat, Why the War on Violent Video Games is Wrong. It's authored, of course, by our guest today, Patrick M. Markey, and co-authored by Christopher J. Ferguson. This podcast is hosted and produced by me, Nico Perino, co-hosted by Ryan Weiss, recorded by me and the fine folks here at Villanova University, and edited by Aaron Reese. 
To learn more about So To Speak, you can follow us on Twitter at twitter.com slash freespeechtalk or like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash so to speak podcast. We also take feedback at so to speak at the fire.org. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts or Google Play or wherever else you get your podcasts. They do help us attract new listeners to the show. And until next time, I thank you all again for listening. Thank you.